Welcome. Uh, this evening we will have a presentation, a discussion about the uh, significant decisions by the United States Supreme Court during its recently concluded term dealing with civil liberties. And uh, uh, I think it'll be an interesting and, and uplifting uh, discussion since I think there were some very, very significant and very positive from our perspective uh, decisions during that term. Um, thanks again for coming as, as you came in. I know you saw uh, we have a uh, six civil liberties teams in our chapter, which is where our work is actually done. Um, if any of, any of you are interested in getting involved in or at least learning about any of those teams, uh, there is a uh, list outside where you can uh, put your name down and, and either, as I said, get involved with the teams or at least ask for information about them as, some, as a uh, prelude perhaps to getting involved. We'd love you to do that because that again is where the actual rubber meets the road, so to speak, for this chapter. We have a board, a board of directors that kind of guides the chapter, but those six, six civil liberties teams are engaged in various projects. Each team has an area of focus, a particular uh, subject or civil liberties uh, focus for its efforts, and that's where we are uh, hopefully uh, going to be making a, a difference. Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce our speaker, Chris Brooke is the legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union of North Carolina, which is our parent affiliate. Uh, our chapter and the other chapters in North Carolina exist, uh, in a sense, as subsidiaries or at least related to uh, the North Carolina affiliate in Raleigh. Um, Chris is uh, in charge of the legal efforts of the affiliate, and in that regard, he obviously follows uh, the case law in this area, and to a great extent, uh, is directly involved in the ACLU's ongoing litigation and other legal efforts uh, within the state and on behalf of the citizens of the state. So let me uh, bring Chris up uh, right now and introduce him and give him the floor and the microphone so he can give us his perspective on what's been going on in, uh, coming out of Washington. Chris. Uh, thanks, Steve. I appreciate the introduction and uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, this evening. Um, what I'm planning to do is go through uh, eight cases um, and, and sort of provide an overview on eight cases that were decided uh, during the course of the 2015-2016 uh, Supreme Court term. Um, and uh, I'm going to highlight both uh, exactly what uh, the holdings in those cases were, but the broader principles that were at play in those cases. I also want to highlight how the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, was involved um, in those cases. We were involved in the, the vast majority of the eight cases uh, that were referenced um, uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, and in the public interest uh, sp uh, sphere, the ACLU has more cases in front of the Supreme Court than any uh, institution in the United States other than the United States government. So um, uh, our outgoing legal director, for example, Steve Shapiro, has argued multiple times uh, in front of the, the Supreme Court and also um, has played a huge role in amicus submiss submissions where we're not directly involved but want to highlight the relevance um, uh, of a particular case and why it's relevant to our members uh, and why uh, a particular result we believe uh, both squares with the Constitution but also with the civil ri rights and civil liberties that we uh, protect. Um, there are a couple uh, areas that I uh, will be touching on this evening um, that the particular cases fall into. Uh, one of the, the first one is sort of a criminal law and a criminal procedure uh, focus. I'm going to highlight some cases. Uh, the second one uh, is sort of a, a race and immigration um, subject matter area. Uh, and then the final one uh, are two cases that touch upon women's rights uh, that I want to highlight. The, the thing that I'll highlight is that the race and immigration and the women's rights cases, I think there's six cases that I'm highlighting, or actually I think five cases that touch on those issues. Four of them are Texas cases. Uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, the, you know, so th there's obviously a Solicitor General's office in the Obama administration uh, that handles uh, arguing the government's positions in these particular cases and successfully did so uh, 
uh, in the Obamacare cases, the uh, same-sex marriage cases, uh, you know, argued, for example, in one of the cases that I'm going to highlight, the, the immigration uh, case of U.S. versus Texas. Uh, but if there's sort of a shadow solicitor general's office for conservatives uh, in the United States, it's actually now pretty much out of the Texas solicitor general's office. Uh, they, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, have litigated, uh, I think, 50 matters during the course of the Obama administration out of the Texas uh, Solicitor General's office. Um, so it really is, you know, if there's Obama Solicitor General's office and there's a conservative Solicitor General's office uh, highlighting their view of what the Constitution uh, means, it really is found in the Texas SG's office. Uh, and then I want to um, turn it over for questions and answers uh, in Q&A and discussion, which will be a lot more interesting than me dryly going through all of these cases and answer questions of both about the, the eight cases that I'm talking about and the broader Supreme Court uh, trajectory. But also, you know, as you all might have noticed, here in Charlotte, there are some cases involving your fine city, uh, as well as the state of North Carolina and the November elections that are speeding through our court system as well. And I imagine that one of you, or perhaps even two, have some questions about those cases and uh, be more than happy uh, to answer uh, those questions as well. But before I go through the eight cases, you know, I want to set the table a little bit uh, and go back uh, and focus very broadly for a moment on the 2014-2015 Supreme Court term. Uh, and that was the regarded by folks who do sort of statistical assessments and, you know, these terms are only so instructive sometimes, but as the most liberal Supreme Court term uh, since the Earl Warren courts of the 1960s. You saw huge victories um, on our side in civil rights and civil liberties law relating to obviously marriage uh, in the Obergefell case. Uh, disproportionate impact uh, uh, can be used to prove Fair Housing Act violations, which has always been the understanding of the FHA, but was reaffirmed five to four by the Supreme Court in 2015. There was a huge Pregnancy Discrimination uh, Act case uh, that made it easier for uh, women who have been discriminated against due to um, their pregnancy in the workplace to sue successfully, all coming down uh, in the 2014 2015 uh, term. Not, not all of those, two of those three cases that I just referenced were decided on 5-4 votes with Justice Kennedy who is and historically has been quite conservative if you look at the Supreme Court more broadly and put it in the context of the Warren Court, for example, of the 60s. Um, quite conservative, but in both of those cases, providing the key vote that ultimately held sway in both the Fair Housing Act case and the marriage uh, case. And the marriage case got the most attention as it's really the culmination of a key uh, area in, uh, in constitutional law that Justice Kennedy really sort of fathered all the way through st uh, starting from 1996 and the Romer decision that for the first time uh, demonstrated some sort of heightened scrutiny uh, that uh, would be shown towards uh, governmental regulations that disproportionately harm the LGBT community through to Lawrence versus Texas, which struck down Texas's sodomy ban, to the Windsor decision that struck down Section 3 of the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, uh, and then the marriage decision. Um, uh, so based on those cases, you can think that Justice Kennedy is you know, quite a liberal justice. Outside of the LGBT rights context, um, especially prior to the last couple of years, that's not the case. He's really historically quite conservative outside of the LGBT uh, context and was the swing vote. So tons of conservative decisions and there was a school of thought that thought that the 2014-2015 Supreme Court term was kind of anomalous, uh, that it was an outlier uh, and that essentially that there were just a number of liberal cases or cases that were good for the liberal portion of the Supreme Court that made their way up at the same time. Uh, and that 2015, 2016 term would sort of be empire strikes back uh, 
to the original Star Wars movie, um, and that we would have all of these conservative cases um, up in front of the court where Kennedy had traditionally sided with the conservatives, and there'd be really quite a backlash uh, against some of the progress that had been realized in civil rights and civil liberties law uh, in the prior term. Um, you know, and those issues uh, in particular are, you know, abortion rights cases. We knew that there were going to be some targeted re regula regulation of abortion uh, practices that would, uh, uh, that would make its, their way up to the Supreme Court. Kennedy has been quite, though he was a member of the Casey decision in 1992 that upheld Roe versus Wade, more broadly has been very conservative in regards to abortion rights. Uh, and has rarely met a regulation of abortion that he did not think could be squared with the Constitution. Uh, executive action, Kennedy is a big believer in federalism and the power that the states uh, have, and everyone knew that um, the, the, the Obama administration's DAPA program deferred uh, action uh, for parental uh, arrivals would be up at the Supreme Court. Uh, this term and a lot of speculation that that would be struck down given Justice Kennedy's safeguarding um, state power um, throughout the course of his tenure on the Supreme Court. And then the Fisher case, which is an affirmative action case out of Texas that had ping-ponged back and forth through uh, the court system on a number of occasions, uh, Justice Kennedy had never upheld an affirmative action program, never voted to uphold an affirmative action program when affirmative action cases had come up. Uh, uh, in the past. For example, the University of Michigan's program that was challenged in Grutter, he was part of the four dissenting uh, justices who would have struck down the program as being a violation of the 14th Amendment. Uh, so abortion, executive action, uh, affirmative action, these all looked like things where we would lose Kennedy's vote and potentially there'd be retrenchment uh, from progress that had been made historically on these fronts uh, at lower courts. But then, you know, like, I don't need to tell you all what happened. Uh, on February 13th, earlier this year, Justice Scalia died uh, unexpectedly uh, in Texas. It all goes back to Texas. We'll have to, like, play a bingo card with Texas here at some point. Um, and he died in the middle of the 2015-2016 term. And he died before uh, six of the eight cases that I'm going to talk about tonight were decided. And, you know, uh, it's pretty easy to understand how his absence uh, changed uh, the outcome that courts, the court would have realized in a number of these cases. I think the immigration case, U.S. versus Texas, is certainly one. Um, and then uh, Zubik, uh, the case about the contraceptive mandate uh, portion of the Affordable Care Act, uh, is another one. So just at this moment, um, when it appears that there's going to be uh, perhaps a step back to a more conservative version of the Supreme Court that we you know, historically associated with Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia dies and throws everything up into the air um, and leaves you with an eight justice court. And I, you know, the results of that are, 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 there are a lot of results from that. First, you, know, you lost the, you have a quieter Supreme Court because you lost the most aggressive questioner uh, on the Supreme Court. Um, Justice Thomas asked a question for the first time in a decade. Um, and it's almost, you can draw a direct line in my mind uh, from Justice Scalia's death to Justice Thomas asking a question because it was a case about whether someone who um, had been convicted of a domestic violence offense could be barred um, for their lifetime from owning a handgun uh, from Maine, a case out of Maine, and uh, Justice, Sc uh, Justice Thomas, asking a very Justice Scalia-like line of questions, asked whether there were any other constitutional rights that could be taken away due to such an offense. So there's one result, is that Justice Thomas spoke and asked a number of questions. Um, I think another result is that you saw uh, more modest, narrow decisions um, and, I, and we'll touch on that a little bit, but you very much saw the Supreme Court working very hard to avoid 4-4 four, four ties uh, so that they don't look like politicians in robes um, where Republicans line up over here and Democrats line up over here, which you know I think 
anyone can agree, regardless of your ideological um, uh, per, uh, perspective, would not be good for the judiciary. Um, you also just saw the court struggling, as we'll see during the course of reviewing these cases, struggling to decide de decisive issues uh, and divisive issues, and de decide issues decisively that were divisive. Um, they had a way to do that previously with nine justices without a ninth justice. These oftentimes end up um, when they're ideological uh, uh, cases resulting in 4-4 ties. Um, but the broader result, um, as Steve referenced in the introduction, is that you had another relatively progressive term of the Supreme Court. Um, and a lot of that directly owes to the fact that Justice Scalia's fifth vote for more conservative results disappeared. In at least one instance, uh, the Fisher case, it appears as though Justice Kennedy has just had some sort of late career uh, reappraisal of uh, affirmative action programs uh, and programs that take into account ongoing racial biases uh, in our society. Uh, the Fair Housing Act case that he decided last year upholding uh, you know, essentially FHA claims where you could show that blacks were uh, disproportionately impacted just based on statistical information um, was a really big surprise because Justice Roberts has moved towards what I think he would term a colorblind court, which typically just means that you ignore racism unless somebody is dumb enough to say it out loud explicitly, um, when it, which in 2016 does not happen nine times out of 10, unless you're the North Carolina legislature. <laughs> um, yeah, that's for later. Uh, but most of the time, the way that these uh, racial biases become apparent is by looking at statistical data. So Justice Kennedy uh, upholding that as a way to get out Housing Act claims was a huge deal and very surprising. And I think the affirmative action decision also taking into account how higher uh, uh, education institutions can realize true diversity uh, uh, within the ranks uh, of their schools uh, is also very surprising, but also reads a little bit um, like there's been an evolution in his thinking on those issues. Um, obviously, if, if there's one person on the Supreme Court that you're likely to know, it was Justice Scalia. Um, he was, I, I think a generous way of characterizing him would be colorful. Um, I could think of other words, but you know, let's be polite. Um, but in fairness, he, you know, from our perspective on civil liberties and civil rights, he was very bad on women's rights. He was very bad on LGBT rights. He was awful on church state issues. Uh, he was awful on race issues. Uh, but, you know, I can't say that it was entirely a positive for our civil rights and civil liberties focus of the ACLU to lose Justice Scalia because Justice Scalia was actually oftentimes better on the Fourth Amendment uh, and on um, uh, restricting sort of uh, out of control government searches, seizures than Justice Breyer who's typically the most conservative of the Democratic appointees uh, to the court. Uh, and there were a number of Fourth Amendment cases that got decided in uh, Justice Scalia's uh, later years on the court, where it was Justice Scalia and the three women on the court, Justices Ginsburg, uh, Sotomayor, and Kagan, uh, joining together uh, to dissent, uh, and occasionally getting Justice Thomas, occasionally getting Justice Breyer for a fifth vote. So, you know, that's, that tees me up for the first case I want to talk about, but it also you know, highlights that there is a progressive streak, um, idiosyncratic as it was, to Justice Scalia's jurisprudence. And you know, I think that the ACLU did a wonderful document that reviewed uh, Merrick Garland's time on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals that I very much encourage all of y'all uh, to read through. And I think that, that by and large, it's a very, cons uh, a very uh, encouraging record about uh, real respect for our civil rights and civil liberties being borne out uh, during his tenure on, um, on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, one way in which he was oftentimes deviating from the ACLU was in regards to the Fourth Amendment. Uh, 
He's very deferential to prosecutors. Uh, as a former prosecutor, perhaps uh, that's not that surprising. Uh, his first opinion on the D.C. Circuit was upholding a questionable search uh, of a car. Um, so, you know, uh, on, for example, LGBT rights, the difference between Justice Scalia and if uh, Merrick Garland does replace him will be immense. But on, you know, other issues that we care about a, a great deal as well, you know, it might not be all positive. So that tees me up to talk about the first case that I wanted to talk about uh, this evening which is, uh, you know, starts our focus on criminal law and criminal procedure. Um, and it's a case called uh, Utah versus Streif. Um, so this case involves basically a bad Terry stop. Um, so a Terry stop is where the, the police are allowed to briefly detain uh, an individual based on a reasonable suspicion of involvement in criminal activity. Reasonable suspicion of criminal involvement uh, of, of invol uh, suspicion of involvement in criminal activity. That's already a very nebulous standard, right? Um, so uh, already cutting law enforcement a great deal of slack there. But this was an instance where everybody agreed that this was a bad Terry stop, that there was no uh, basis uh, and suspicion that allowed the stop to occur. Uh, the South Salt Lake uh, Police Department received an anonymous tip about narcotics activity uh, at a house. Uh, a police officer observed the house for over a week's time, and uh, the nature of the visits that occurred at the house raised the suspicion that the, houses, the, the occupant of the house uh, was dealing drugs. Uh, one of the visitors to the house was Mr. Streif, uh, who the officer uh, subsequently detained in a convenience store parking lot after uh, Streif left the house. So, you know, there's no reasonable basis to believe that Mr. Streif had been engaged in criminal activity, unless you believe just going into a house that you might believe is a, a house in which drugs are being dealt out of qualifies. But Utah didn't even argue that. Um, what uh, they did, what they highlighted and what they focused on is the fact that the officer asked for Streif's identification when he gave the information to the police dispatcher, the dispatcher informed the officer who had stopped him that there was an outstanding arrest warrant for Mr. Streif. The officer arrested Streif based on that outstanding arrest warrant and found a bag of methamphetamine and drug paraphernalia on his person. Uh, so he was charged with unlawful possession of methamphetamine, uh, drug paraphernalia, and he moved to suppress the evidence, claiming that the evidence was illegally obtained during an unlawful uh, investigatory stop. So this went through, all the way through the Utah uh, court system. He was originally found guilty, and the motion to suppress was um, uh, turned down, uh, but the Utah Supreme Court ultimately reversed the trial court's uh, determination. The Supreme Court, decided 5-3 to reverse the Utah Supreme Court. So the 5-3 matchup here was sort of the four conservatives on the Supreme Court, Thomas, uh, Alito, Roberts, Kennedy, and then Breyer, providing uh, the fifth vote. And then the three women, um, typically on the more progressive end of the Supreme Court in regards to these issues, uh, dissenting. And what the majority said was that, you know, that the, and this is a Thomas decision, that the reason behind the doctrine of suppressing evidence, um, uh, they discuss the reason we, we suppress evidence uh, and exceptions to the rules uh, where evidence is suppressed. Um, and in this case, they said that the exception at play was the attenuation doctrine, which makes suppressed evidence uh, admissible when the connection between the unconstitutional police action, in this case, the stop without a basis, and the evidence that was ultimately found, the methamphetamine and drug paraphernalia, uh, were uh, attenuated, remote, or interrupting, interrupted by an intervening circumstance. And in this case, they said the attenuation doctrine applied because there was this intervening circumstance of learning that there was an outstanding warrant uh, for Mr. Streep's arrest. Um, and they said that the, the arresting officer's conduct here was, was just negligent, not flagrantly engaging in misconduct. 
you know, who can see problems with this logic? I mean, the, 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 the glaring problem is that now an officer can stop anyone and then call a dispatcher. And if they have a warrant out, you find you can then search that person and you're not going to get in any trouble for the original stop, which was entirely baseless. Um, I imagine that those sort of stops would not happen that frequently in the neighborhood that we're in this evening. I imagine that there are neighborhoods in Charlotte where those sorts of stops happen quite regularly. And that's the point that Justice Sotomayor's dissent really highlights immensely. And I want to read from parts of it because it's exceptionally powerful stuff. If you haven't had an opportunity to read this dissent from her, I, I really encourage you to do so. Um, and this is, it's interesting, and we shouldn't give up hope on Merrick Garland because she's a former prosecutor as well. Um, before she was a judge, she was a prosecutor um, uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. So she knows what's going on um, uh, quite well. So here's what she writes. This case involves a suspicionless search, one in which the officers initiated this chain of events without justification. As the Justice Department notes, many innocent people are subjected to the humiliation of these unconstitutional stop searches. The white defendant in this case uh, shows that anyone's dignity can be violated in this matter, manner. But it is no secret that people of color are disproportionate victims of this type of scrutiny. For generations, black and brown parents have given their, their children the talk, instructing them never to run down the street Always keep your hands where they can be seen. Do not even think of talking back to a stranger, all out of fear of how an officer with a gun will react to them. By legitimizing the conduct that produces this double consciousness, this case tells everyone, white and black, guilty and innocent, that an officer can verify your legal status at any time. It says that your body is subject to invasion while courts excuse the violation of your rights. It implies that you're not a citizen of a democracy, but the subject of a carceral state just waiting to be cataloged. We must not pretend that the countless people who are routinely targeted by the police are isolated. They are the canaries in the coal mine whose deaths, civil and literal, warn us that no one can breathe in this atmosphere. They are the ones who recognize that unlawful police stops corrode all our civil liberties and threaten all our lives. Until their voices matter too, our justice system will continue to be anything but. I mean, you do not read um, Supreme Court opinions, even dissents, uh, that are this on point, in my opinion, very frequently. Uh, in the course of that passage, um, Justice Sotomayor cites to Michelle Anderson's The New Jim Crow, which if you haven't read, is very much worth reading, former ACLU uh, staff attorney. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folks, but Black Folk, James Baldwin, uh, and uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, Between the World of me and Me. I mean, again, this is not the stuff that you typically read on Supreme Court, in Supreme Court opinions, because it's very much um, more connected to people's day-to-day -day lives uh, and how uh, people's interactions with the police, in fact, uh, do take place um, and, um, and the consequences of those interactions. So the ACLU submitted a, an amicus brief uh, in this case, arguing that the exclusionary rule should apply and attenuation exception should not. Uh, and the brief argued that uh, deterrence is not the only benefit of suppression but uh, judicial integrity and restoring uh, the public's faith uh, in the judiciary uh, is something that can be a check, a real check, on uh, overzealous uh, law enforcement uh, is uh, something uh, worth uh, supporting uh, suppression for as well. Um, but again, this is not a case that broke down on typical uh, conservative liberal grounds. I mean, there's a little bit of that there, but Justice Breyer provides uh, the key vote. There's no guarantee about uh, where a Justice Garland would be on this issue. So that's case one. Case two, um, uh, so we've gotten one of the bummer cases out of the way. Uh, Steve said, no, those are an uplifting uh, term. So I got one out of the way right off the bat. 
uh, a, a, a more uplifting case and one that was actually decided before Justice Scalia's death, just a few weeks before Justice Scalia's death, is, uh, but actually one in which his um, absence would not have been relevant had, uh, had been decided later, is Montgomery versus Louisiana. And uh, this case goes back to a case that was decided uh, in 2012 by the Supreme Court uh, called Miller versus Alabama. Uh, and in Miller versus Alabama, the Supreme Court decided that mandatory life sentences without parole for juveniles who are convicted of a homicide violate the Eighth Amendment. So basically, you know, if, if a 15-year-old uh, is, uh, is sentenced to life, it can't be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, um, uh, without that violating uh, the prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment under the, the Eighth Amendment. And this is why, you know, when people, and Justice Scalia talked about this endlessly, about this, the Constitution being a dead document, sort of a static document. This is why it's so important that the Constitution be understood as anything but a static document. When you look at all of the advances that have occurred in the past generation in regards to youth brain development uh, and decision making and impulsiveness, uh, and all of the advances in understanding that that we did not have when a lot of these life without the possibility of parole uh, statutes were put in place, um, uh, it's exceptionally important that we be able to take that evolving knowledge and apply it to our current circumstance. Um, the Montgomery in this case uh, you know, killed a police officer when he was 17 years old. Uh, he was sentenced to life without parole and had been in custody for almost 50 years. Um, when Miller was decided in 2012. So there's not a question here about whether there has been adequate punishment in my mind. I mean, 50 years is, is, a, is a hugely consequential uh, punishment. So M Montgomery uh, sought relief in the state court and was denied, um, and the Supreme Court reversed that decision um, six to three to give uh, Montgomery relief in this case. And this was a decision that was authored by uh, Justice Kennedy with Breyer, Kagan, Sotomayor, uh, Ginsburg, and Chief Justice Roberts uh, joining in the majority. So a 6-3 decision as opposed to a 5-4 uh, decision. Um, the majority first held that, that the Supreme Court had jurisdiction over the case. There's some procedural things here uh, because um, state collateral review courts uh, must be given retroactive effect, must give retroactive effect to substantive rules. Um, the majority then held that the rule articulated in Miller was a substantive rule because it applied to a class of defendants because of their status uh, of juveniles whose criminal activity uh, reflected immaturity. So, and this is the point that the ACLU made uh, in their amicus brief, is that you know, this uh, you know, is not merely a new procedural rule, um, but you know, treats an entirely, uh, entire class of defendants in a completely different way with different substantive outcomes. Uh, and therefore, uh, if you were sentenced under the previous regime that we've now struck down, you should be able to get relief even if your sentence occurred um, way back in the day when that sentence would have been held to be constitutional. And what the ACLU's amicus argued uh, in Montgomery was that Miller should reply retroactively, even if it was a procedural rule, because it's such a watershed uh, procedural rule, uh, that to refuse to apply it retroactively uh, would do grave injustice uh, in this circumstance. Uh, Justice Scalia, in one of the final opinions that he wrote for the, the court, dissented. Um, unsurprisingly, as he was generally not great outside of the Fourth Amendment on criminal law. The, uh, the next case that I want to highlight is Hearst versus Florida. Uh, this case was also decided um, before Justice Scalia passed away um, and involved the death penalty and how people are sentenced to death. Um, I'm sure you all have read that Justice Breyer with Justice Ginsburg uh, in a case called Glossop wrote a very long dissent that argued um, after sort of tiptoeing up to this over, over a number of years that the death penalty was unconstitutional, uh, that it uh, was 
uh, not applied in anything like a fair fashion. Um, highlighting, for example, that um, there really were only about 25 jurisdictions in the United States where you got the death penalty. It's basically just like, is there a prosecutor um, who likes the death penalty uh, in that area? Um, so its application was entirely arbitrary. I think that they looked at Connecticut and all of the death sentences that had been handed down in Connecticut over a period of time had come from one prosecutor. And then, of course, there's the racial dynamics of who gets uh, the death penalty, which are, as you can imagine, they would be. Um, this was not one of those cases, but continues the Supreme Court's sort of slow walk towards, at the very least, curtailing the circumstances in which the death penalty can be applied and um, sort of the, pr the processes and the procedures that can be uh, utilized to apply the death penalty. So Hearst was charged with murdering his coworker. A Florida statute uh, gave the jury the power to recommend the death penalty, but the judge had the power to make the ultimate sentencing decision independent of the jury's recommendation. So the jury's just kind of there. You know, they can say something and the judge can entirely ignore it. In this instance, the jury recommended the death penalty uh, for Hearst by a seven to five vote. This is not, in any way, an overwhelming vote, let alone a unanimous vote. Uh, and the, but the judge ultimately made the decision and sentenced Hearst to death. Um, that was reversed uh, and remanded, um, and the court, by an eight to one uh, ruling, in an eight to one ruling, held that their uh, capital sentencing scheme was unconstitutional because it placed the decision of sentencing a defendant in the hands of the judge. Uh, as opposed to the jury, uh, which violated the constitutional right uh, to a jury. And this goes back to a case called Ring versus Arizona in which SCOTUS held that uh, it was unconstitutional for a judge in place of a jury to find aggregating factors that resulted in a death sentence uh, instead of life imprisonment. Excuse yeah. me. What, what state, I may have missed this, but what state are you talking about? Florida. Florida. Yeah, Florida. Um, eight to one decision, um, Sotomayor writing the decision, the sole dissent was from Alito. So, you know, uh, I, I think at least some of this should make you feel a little bit better about the, 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 that the Supreme Court is not politicians in robes because you can see a lot of these decisions are overwhelmingly arrived at with people with quite different uh, takes on uh, whether the Constitution is alive or dead among other things, uh, arriving at a similar conclusion. Uh, Alito dissented uh, from the decision because he's generally wrong. Um, <laughs> he's almost always wrong, um, very rarely right. Um, the ACLU submitted uh, an amicus brief uh, that focused on uh, the fact that Florida's capital sentencing uh, scheme uh, required a simple majority to recommend the death penalty to the judge um, and did not even require a simple majority um, of the jury to agree on an aggravating factor to recommend the death penalty. So you could have seven people saying uh, that a, a defendant deserves the death penalty but for seven different reasons. Um, and you know, I think w when you're dealing with a, a human life, that, that's a little bit unnerving. Um, a postscript to this case is uh, that Al uh, Florida, after this, uh, moved to change the rules and took away uh, the right of essentially the judge to overrule the jury, but uh, said that you could be sentenced to death with a supermajority of 10 out of 12 on a jury voting uh, to condemn you to death. Uh, so again, sticking with a non-unanimous structure that has been abandoned by 47 states. The only other two states that have such non-unanimous structures are Alabama and Delaware. Um, the, I, 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 I don't know that they fixed that either. I, didn't, I don't know if I looked at that this morning. Um, but I don't know that they fixed that either. But what I do know is that, that was struck, the supermajority was struck down um, by a Florida trial court judge uh, subsequent to the Supreme Court's decision 
adopting essentially the argument that the ACLU had made in their amicus that there needed to be unanimity uh, in the jury, uh, on the jury to uh, carry out a death penalty. Um, that case continues to go forward uh, through the um, uh, through the Florida appellate court system at present. Do I understand that all the states except these two require uh, a total all the jurors yep. voting for and that's right. the death penalty? That's right. There has to be unanimity that the death penalty is warranted in this circumstance. So I, I impose on civil liberties and civil rights what I call the Mississippi test. And if Mississippi um, has gotten something right and you're lagging behind Mississippi, you have a problem. Uh, Mississippi requires unanimity to put someone to death. Um, only Florida, Alabama, kind of a ju junior partner to the Mississippi test in my book, uh, and Delaware don't allow, you know, don't require unanimity. So now we're reaching the Texas portion of our program where we'll talk about <laughs> Texas for the next four cases in some way, shape, or form. So, so to start out right, because I imagine somebody's lived in Texas in here at some point, Texas kind of did the right thing. On, on, it's a big state. Uh, Texas kind of did the right thing in the first case, which is called uh, Evenwell versus uh, uh, Abbott, uh, and was decided um, shortly after Justice Scalia's death. So under the Constitution, uh, congressional districts are redrawn every 10 years to ensure equal representation based on uh, uh, total population. The plaintiffs in this case, including Sue Evenwell, uh, resident were residents of Texas Senate districts with high voter eligible populations um, and they argued that basing apportionment on total population diluted their votes in relation to voters in other Senate districts so let me unpack that a little bit Texas obviously has a lot of folks who are uh, not eligible to vote uh, for some reason or another but they are counted uh, when districts are drawn up. These include children, um, folks who are incarcerated uh, in your congressional district, uh, and undocumented immigrants, uh, which the, of which there are a number uh, in Texas. But um, obviously children have a vested interest um, and their interests should be taken into account. Uh, when decisions are made by elected representatives. So simply what the, the plaintiffs were arguing here was we should only count when we're divvying up folks who are eligible to vote. So children, prisoners, undocumented immigrants, no, you're all kicked out. We don't count you in our population votes when we do the census. Um, and, you know, I think there are a lot of questions about whether that's feasible um, or even possible to engage in anything like an accurate count and divvy that up. Uh, but the arguments uh, that folks on the other side said were the arguments that I just made, which um, was essentially, and the arguments made by the ACLU, which is that these other parties who are not voters yet certainly could, will get the right to vote oftentimes, uh, and also uh, very much have interests that are being uh, impacted uh, and should not be ignored uh, in these circumstances. Um, this was a 8-0 um, decision uh, authored by uh, Justice Ginsburg, but there's a concurrent, their concurrence by both Thomas and Alito here. Um, and what you can see here is the court basically reaching a very narrow decision um, uh, in order to avoid a deeper controversy while only having eight justices. And what they say is, uh, it is entirely compatible with the U.S. Constitution to divvy up these districts based on the total population. What they don't say, in the opinion, is that you have to do it that way, which has historically been the understanding, that you have to do it that way. They just say, you certainly can, so you lose. Uh, but Texas actually said, you know, you can do it this way, but you don't have to do it this way. So in the future, you know, some state could come along and decide that they're going to draw districts uh, based on voter eligible population as opposed to total population. And then there'd be a challenge about whether that is permissible ever. 
and in the concurrences that were written by Alito and Thomas, they seem to very clearly signal that they think that that would entirely be fine. Ginsburg seems to point in the other direction, but it essentially leaves that key question unanswered because, you know, at least you would have had a 6-2 decision, but it's unclear exactly where Kennedy and Roberts would be on such a, a, a case, uh, on that matter as well. Um, the, the ACLU and the ACLU of Texas filed an amicus in support of the governor and the, the secretary of state of um, uh, uh, Texas uh, and, and essentially noted that the founders embraced the Republican principle of equal representation uh, and a principle consistent uh, with the belief that a legitimate government draws its power uh, from all of the people, not just eligible voters for the reasons that I articulated. Uh, previously. So that's it for Texas kind of doing the right thing. From this point forward, it's all Texas playing, playing to its typecasting. Um, the first um, case is, is, is Fisher versus uh, University of Texas, which is affirmative action case. Um, and is the, you know, uh, the latest in a long line of affirmative action cases. Um, the first of which was uh, a case called Baki uh, that said that quota systems uh, were impermissible but held out that affirmative action um, short of a quota system uh, could be constitutional. Uh, there was the Gruder case that I referenced previously um, where it was a 5-4 decision with Justice O'Connor um, writing the decision that upheld uh, the University of Michigan's affirmative action program with Justice Kennedy in the dissent, writing the dissent for the four dissenters in that case. And uh, Justice O'Connor, um, you know, at the end of her opinion, sort of bizarrely noted that affirmative action should like end in 25 years. And we're not quite to 25 years after Grutter, but we're, we're getting there. Um, so, with this case, you know, made its way up, we were exceptionally nervous about it. So the issue here was whether or not it was constitutional for the admissions program at University of Texas to consider race as one factor among many in attempting to create uh, a diverse educational experience for its students. Um, UT's admission system had two components. First, under the state's top 10% law, UT offered admissions to all those who graduated in the top 10% of their high school class. Um, and the remainder of the class, uh, roughly 25% of the total, uh, was offered admission uh, based on a combination of an, what they call an academic index and a personal achievement index, which took into account SAT scores, high school academic, performance, um, uh, as well as, amongst other factors, race. Uh, Abigail Fisher, who, I'm just going to say this, in no way was in any way qualified to attend the University of Texas and would not have been admitted uh, if she were African American, um, if you look at the statistics, uh, which makes this case particularly galling to think about it. She was just not a competitive applicant, period. Um, said that she uh, was denied admission based on race being taken into account by uh, University of Texas. So um, the Supreme Court, well, so let me, let me, so Steve Shapiro, we have an, a national staff conference once a year. Steve Shapiro does a much better version of what I'm doing right here, um, talking about big cases from the past term and big cases that are upcoming. Fisher has been on that program a number of times because it was up at the Supreme Court in 2013. It made its way back up. And, you know, he was like, you know, basically, uh, we're going we're gonna to lose. Um, and the question is how we lose. Um, the thought was, especially after Justice Scalia died, that they would strike down this program and say that the 10% um, rule that took the top 10% of the class and populated a large portion of UT's program resulted in the uh, uh, realization of the governmental interest here because that had resulted in diversity at University of Texas and arguably a critical mass of racial diversity at University of Texas. Why did the 10% rule 
in part realize that diversity because Texas's secondary schools are horribly segregated. So there are basically black high schools and Latino high schools and white high schools. So if you just take the top 10%, you actually do get a fair amount of diversity. Although it's perverse in my mind to up, say you don't need affirmative action because this program that gives us diversity via segregation of our secondary schools somehow meets the bill. But you know, there was thought that that would actually be an okay way to lose because it's a Texas specific way to lose. That program is unique to Texas um, and it's a lot better than the second way which you could lose where they just say affirmative action is unconstitutional, period. Um, we thought that if we were gonna win, that the way we would win is that they would say that Abigail Fisher didn't have standing. Um, and the way she didn't have standing is the way she argued she had standing was that she paid an admission fee. Uh, she paid an application fee, which everybody has to pay um, to apply to a university. Suffice it to say, that is the slenderest read on which to get legal standing to sue. Um, standing is something that, you know, conservatives never find until they want to decide a case um, like this one. You know, in another context, something so weak um, as uh, an application fee that everybody has to pay would in no way qualify as an injury. Um, but that shows how profoundly um, skeptical we were of our chances. This was actually a seven justice court sitting um, to decide this case because Justice Scalia had passed away and Justice Kagan recused herself. Um, they don't make plain why they recuse themselves, but in this case, um, the case had been pinging around the court system for so long, it seems plain that it was in the Obama Solicitor General's office when she was Obama's Solicitor General, uh, and she had participated in this case at a lower level uh, in deliberations relating to how to handle this, so she was out as well. Um, so, um, had Scalia still been alive, you would have had a 4-4 split. Because what happened is that Justice Kennedy, for the first time ever on the court, upheld an affirmative action program um, and uh, ruled and wrote the opinion upholding Texas's program on a 4-3 to three vote. And uh, uh, in the opinion, he uh, found that um, there was a, you know, a good faith interest and a real governmental interest in a diverse student body, um, and that the program here was narrow, narrowly tailored because they did extensive research um, that uh, stood up why this was a good admissions program, um, and also they demonstrated why race-neutral alternatives uh, in the admission program had not been successful in achieving diversity in the past at University of Texas. Um, he did advise that UT, UT should conduct periodic review of its admissions programs uh, in light of the experience of the school has accumulated and the data it has gathered since the adoption of its admission plan. Um, the University of North Carolina was sued over its somewhat similar uh, affirmative action program. Um, they were terrified that they were going to lose um, with Kennedy and Scalia joining a five justice majority to either once and for all fully eviscerate all affirmative action programs or continue to do what Kennedy had always done, which is essentially say there might be an affirmative action program that satisfies strict scrutiny under the 14th Amendment, but this is not that one. Because Kennedy always talked about diversity um, as being an important governmental interest. But until this case in Fisher, he had never found a governmental program, even though the Michigan program looked a lot like this one, uh, met that and was narrowly tailored enough to satisfy uh, the 14th Amendment's requirements. So in, in a way, it was Kennedy's, the result that Kennedy realizes catching up to his rhetoric on point. But it was an exceptionally surprising decision that I think you know, maybe the Fair Housing Act case from the 2014, 2015 term hinted at, uh, but it was still a pretty big shock. The ACLU filed an amicus brief uh, in support of UT, uh, which focused on sort of, a, uh, of the fallacy of equ uh, equating colorblindness with equality. 
Um, and, and one prime example that the amicus brief uh, sort of focused on was the 14th Amendment itself, which was expressly designed to assist African Americans recently freed from slavery. Um, and similarly, programs uh, designed to encourage diversity, such as U2's admission program, are clearly distinguishable from exclusionary policies targeted at disadvantaged minorities, and therefore they should not be held to the same legal standard. Because essentially, like uh, you know, Roberts in, a, in, a, in another school case, the opinion that he wrote that Kennedy was a part of as well, said that the way to stop discriminating based on race is to stop discriminating based on race. Um, you know, which is really, sounds really good until you turn your brain on. Um, but I mean, it, it is this notion that we should just, um, despite the fact that we have not arrived there, and certainly the experience for African Americans and Latinos in our country is not a colorblind experience, we should pretend that we've arrived there and be colorblind and therefore treat any distinction based on race uh, as being problematic as opposed to exclusion of African Americans or racial minorities as being particularly um, pernicious and problematic. Um, continuing with Texas, you had uh, university, uh, United States versus Texas, um, uh, which was uh, the case challenging the Department of Homeland Security's establishment of the deferred action for parents of uh, Americans in uh, lawful permanent residence, is oftentimes called DAPA, um, and also uh, expanding the deferred action for childhood arrivals uh, program. Um, uh, basically, uh, what this did was said that uh, if you were, what DAPA did is if you were the parent of someone who's a United States citizen, or uh, a lawful uh, permanent resident, um, then for two years, the United States would agree that they would not move uh, in any way um, to take deportation action against you if you were not in trouble uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and Texas and 25 other states, including, um, I believe, our governor, uh, uh, filed suit arguing that DAPA violated the Administrative Procedure Act and the Take Care Clause. And the district court um, in Brownsville, Texas, issued a, a nationwide preliminary injunction uh, on the ground that the states were likely to succeed on their claim and that DAPA was uh, subject to the APA's procedural requirements. Let me unpack a couple of things there. First, this whole, the decision, um, the, the, this decision was realized um, and the case was argued after uh, Justice Scalia passed away and was decided after Justice Scalia um, passed away. Um, so it rocketed through the court system. Um, but as the result indicates, um, it, as long as it's an eight justice court, lower courts are going to have a huge, are gonna have a lot more sway in regards to what violates the Constitution, what does not violate the Constitution, um, and what is and is not uh, illegal. And that very much is, is shown by this circumstance. Because the district court here, which is the lowest rung of the federal court, issued a nationwide injunction that blocked the whole DAPA program uh, from being in effect. One judge did. Fifth Circuit upheld uh, his decision two to one, and it gets up to the Supreme Court very quickly. So there are basically two frames through which to view this case. And the government's frame uh, is that this was a typical use of prosecutorial or governmental discretion uh, in the immigration context where the federal government has not unfettered but very large powers that have always been recognized throughout the course of the republic. So essentially, the United States government does not have regardless of what presidential candidates might say, uh, the resources to deport every undocumented immigrant who is in the United States. The US simply does not have those resources right now that have been provided to DHS. Um, so they have to prioritize um, you know, whether they're gonna do deportations and who they are going to move to deport. 
I mean, the Obama administration has you know, not been great on these issues at all, but has moved over time to uh, exclude larger and larger populations of the undocumented community from deportation proceedings, uh, especially folks who, you know, as is the case with the vast majority of the undocumented uh, immigrant population, have been um, model residents and have had no run-ins with the law whatsoever, or if they have, uh, they have been entirely incident to the fact that they are not citizens, so they've been pulled over without a driver's license. But, you know, um, uh, that is entirely the fact that there are many states that won't give driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants, not necessarily um, anything to do with whether they're a good driver or not. So that is the way that the government viewed the case. We have this many resources, this many undocumented immigrants. We're going to focus narrowly on folks who have um, run afoul of the law uh, for deportation. Um, the Texas and the other 25 states who joined with them argued um, that this was essentially a new rule um, that has to go through what's called notice and comment uh, under the Administrative uh, Procedures Act, Procedure Act. Um, there was also a question about whether Texas had standing uh, to pursue this because the injury Texas had suffered was that they were going to have to issue driver's licenses to folks who were DAPA recipients. Um, again, that is not only a speculative in the future injury, which typically does not satisfy standing for conservatives, but also, you know, if they wanted to, you know, solve that harm, and I wouldn't suggest this, but they just didn't have to issue driver's licenses to DAPA recipients. They could entirely avoid that cost they were really interested in doing so. Um, you know, and the government retorted, you know, responded to this argument about there needing to be notice and comment by saying that every administration, Republican and Democrat, um, had engaged in governmental discretion, prosecutorial discretion, immigration discretion about who they had prioritized for de deportation action. Um, Texas came back and said, but never like this before, it's much larger. Um, there was a per curiam decision noting that this was a 4-4 uh, split. They don't announce who's on what side of the 4-4 split. I can tell you who's on what side of the 4-4 split. Um, this is one that fits ideologically perfectly. Um, uh, Kennedy very clearly joined with the other three conservatives, and it was Breyer and Kagan, Sotomayor, uh, and Ginsburg almost certainly dividing up. What happens with a 4-4 split? It means that the lower court's ruling, the circuit court ruling, 